Good to have you back. Where were you when the water lines were freezing? And <laughs> no, you guys pick a good time. Good time. Praise God. No, I'm glad you're back. Safe, sound. Praise God. Let's pray. Father, we thank you. Oh, we thank you for this opportunity. Lord, I've just touched so much by the worship this morning. You deserve it and more and more and more. No end to your goodness, to your love, to your faithfulness. Holy Spirit, we ask you to teach us this morning. Show us as we move into the end of this gospel all the things that you'd have us to see, all the things you'd have us to know, all the things you'd have us to live. And incorporate that deep into our hearts, Lord. We ask that. We believe for that. We receive that. And everybody said, Amen. Praise God. I have to keep reminding myself that the study we're on is the Gospel of Mark. We're not studying the resurrection. Just so happens that's where the Gospel of Mark is right now. This is where it ends. And uh, Mark, as usual, is so brief in his remarks that we have to reach out into some of the other Gospels. What I'm getting at is things seem a little staccato. It's because of having to go, you know, not blending all of them together because that's not our purpose. Our purpose is to teach Mark. But for one thing, it seems weird, in a sense, that we should even have to talk about this. We can always praise God. I mean, the resurrection is direly important to us. But it would seem like it would be an accepted truth. But it's not even, in, not even accepted in the truth in all the body of Christ. You know, I mean, there, there, are, there, are, there are men that graduate seminary that don't believe that Jesus rose. There's men who graduate seminary who do not believe that Jesus was born of a virgin. Uh, I don't have the statistics with me today, but they're, they're overwhelming and it's just... Uh, the churches that follow this and so on. And uh, we're, we're told to contend for the faith that was handed down to the saints, only the faith that, that some are contending for isn't the faith that was handed down. It's a faith that adapts to the culture of society and says that we are straight-laced, narrow-minded, and that we don't love people. We're all a bunch of racists. Well, so be it. That's the faith that we're going to fight for because it is anything but that. So we're going to celebrate what we shouldn't even have to explain to Christians, the world needs to hear it. We've come to the last chapter of Mark's Gospel. These verses center on the resurrection, which we all know is the main event of the Gospel's message. It is the greatest event in the life of our Lord Jesus Christ. It is the greatest event of history. It is the culminating event in the divine redemption. It is the cornerstone of all the promises of God. It is the source of eternal life for all who believe. Without the resurrection, the cross would have no meaning. Jesus' teachings would have no meaning. They would be, there would be no salvation. The resurrection is the climax of everything Jesus did. The resurrection of Christ is the key to our own resurrection. What is unique to Christianity is that we believe, we who believe in Christ, are promised to be raised from the dead physically, bodily, literally as He was into a resurrection form in which we will live forever. This is, there is no such promise in any other religion, only in Christianity. We look at what Paul said about this as we start today in 1 Corinthians. For those who say, is it, it's enough that I, I don't doubt Jesus. I believe the man lived and I believed he was a great teacher. But why do I have to believe he was born of a virgin? Why do I have to believe he's the only way? Why do I have to believe he resurrected from the dead? Paul gives us the answer. And if Christ is not risen, then our preaching is empty. Some translations say vain, useless. And your faith is also empty. Yes, and we are found false witnesses of God because we have testified of God that He raised up Christ whom He did not raise up if in fact the dead do not rise. For if the dead do not rise, then Christ is not risen. 
And if Christ is not risen, your faith is futile. You are still in your sins. Then also those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men the most pitiable. I think the King James says the most miserable. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men the most miserable. But now Christ is risen from the dead, and he has become the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. All four Gospels tell the resurrection story. Each brings its own uniqueness and its unique features to the story. Blending these different accounts gives us a wonderful perspective of the, uh, amazing, this amazing fact of history. But in all of these accounts, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, in all of these accounts there is one thing that's missing. You know, it's so obvious we, we don't talk about it. There's one thing missing in all of these accounts, and that is the resurrection of Christ. In all of these accounts, the one thing that is missing is the resurrection itself. There's no account of that. There's no description of what happened. All we know is that the tomb is empty. No one was in that tomb to watch what was going to happen. No one can give us, if you will, the analysis of the resurrection. No one saw it. No one can explain it. How it happened... How it, um, bear with me, how it happened is incomprehensible. Jesus' resurrection was as supernatural as creation itself. And there's no explanation. Just like there's no explanation for God. In the beginning, God, and on this day, Jesus rises from the dead. What matters is that it did happen and that it is fully attested by all four gospel writers. Not surprisingly, Mark's account is the briefest of the four. Mark is always in a hurry, so let's go ahead and read his. Mark gives us the whole resurrection in eight verses. Now when the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James and Salome, Salome brought, bought spices that they might come and anoint him. Very early in the morning on the first day of the week, they came to the tomb when the sun had risen. And they said among themselves, who will roll away the stone from the door of the tomb for us? But when they looked up, they saw that the stone had been rolled away, for it was very large. And entering the tomb, they saw a young man clothed in a long white robe sitting on the right side. And they were alarmed. But he said to them, Do not be alarmed. You seek Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He is risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him. But go, tell his disciples and Peter that he is going before you into Galilee. There you will see him, as he said to you. So they went out quickly and fled from the tomb, for they trembled and were amazed, and they said nothing to anyone for they were afraid. We have just completed the Gospel of Mark. Now you should have a big question for me right now. You should be looking in your Bible and saying, Skip, what happened to the last 11 verses? I'll explain that in a little bit. Mark ends his Gospel with the amazing fact of the resurrection and the grip of this powerful truth has on, these, uh, on the souls of these women. Matthew, Luke, and John all go beyond where Mark stops his narrative. Each of them, each of these writers were inspired individually by the Holy Spirit. Yet they blend into a harmonious story. It attests to the divine authorship of Scripture. We should remember that for all the humans involved in this event at the tomb, all are in different stages of shock. I think we forget that. Every person that we're going to see, everything we're going to talk about here, every one of these, maybe except Pilate himself, and maybe he's included, everybody is in a certain state of shock. 
We've just come on this side to accept. Oh, it's Easter. It's, it's Resurrection Day. Jesus is risen from the dead. But you have to understand, they don't know any of this. All they know is He is dead, and they know that all their dreams have perished with Him. It is a wonder. That it is a testimony to their love for Christ that they're even bringing these spices to the tomb. Why bother? He's dead. The dreams are dead. Why not pick up, pack up, and just leave? Why even? Notice it says they didn't bring spices. It says they bought spices. wonder who they had to wake up that early in the morning to buy all these things. So it's a great testimony of their love because why bother? The man is dead. The dreams are gone. So we should remember that all of these events are, have to do with a certain state of shock. The gospel writer penned these words years after the event, but their words take us back to what it must have really been like on that day. That must have been a Sabbath that they all hated. Let me say that again. That Passover Sabbath must have been a Sabbath. You know, the Sabbath is everything. It's everything to the Jewish religion is the Sabbath day. Everything happens around the Sabbath. But they must have hated this Sabbath. Why? Because the women knew he was involved in an incomplete burial on Friday evening. And now you've got Saturday where by the law you cannot go and anoint him. You cannot walk over so many steps. You cannot, you cannot, you cannot, you cannot. And all they wanted to do was rush to that tomb and show their love to him. And they couldn't do it because the Sabbath stood in their way. Let's begin then. Mark tells us, now when the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome, Salome had brought spices, I think it has bought spices, that they might come and anoint him. The Sabbath, Saturday, is over. We're about 12 hours into Sunday. Luke says, on the first day of the week, and just, just a point for your own knowledge, for your own biblical knowledge, the Jews did not have names for days. They didn't have a Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. All they had was the Sabbath and how every day related to the Sabbath. If they were going to pick a particular day, they would say, well, three days after the Sabbath, three days before the Sabbath, four days after the Sabbath. They did not have any names for their days because their whole cycle of time was established around the Sabbath day. Jesus' body had been in the grave Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. If you've ever bogged down on that and said, well, how in the world can they say he was in the ground three days and three nights? Because you have to understand how the Jews accounted for time. It's different than ours. It's from 6 p.m. to 6 a.m. And in the Jewish uh, custom, uh, for any part of that day, anything in that part of the day constituted the fulfillment of that day. So Jesus is in the grave Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. It's now Sunday morning, the first day of the week past the Sabbath. The, these events of the days are going to change the way time is figured forever. Because up to that, up till that weekend, everything changes on this weekend. You think about all the changes that have happened. The greatest day for the Jews had been the Saturday. This is the Sabbath. Now it will be Sunday. This is a dramatic shift. From that weekend on, no Sabbath has been necessary. From that weekend, no Sabbath has been legitimate. Just as since the upper room communion, no Passover has been legitimate. Everything has changed. In time, Sunday will no longer be called the first day, but it will become to be known as the Lord's Day. The women mentioned in verse 1 here, along with others, have been around a long time. They have followed Jesus since the early days of his ministry in Galilee. They have followed him. They have ministered to him. You know, and we never hear how they ministered to him. We never read that they ministered to the other apostles, but they may have. These are like the camp followers of Jesus. They are faithful. I wonder really if, 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 if they didn't believe long before the apostles, long before Peter said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. These women were with him, and I imagine they cooked for him and sewed and did whatever they could do to help. 
Maybe going in and getting food from the different towns and different things. We have no idea. But they, they're not late to the party. These women have been there longer than the apostles. And they have followed him and ministered to him. It never says that the apostles ministered to Jesus. It was always these women and the angels are the only two that are ever mentioned. They have followed him. They have ministered to him. And two of these women... At least two of these women observed the burial by Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus. We go back to Mark 15. Then Joseph of Arimathea bought, maybe I was him, I was saying, bought fine linen, took him down and wrapped him in the linen, and he laid him in a tomb which had been hewn out of the rock, and rolled a, store, rolled a stone against the door of the tomb. And Mary Magdalene, this is interesting, and Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of Joseph observed where he was laid. Some even say that they were sitting across from it, watching. John, uh, you've got whoever maybe uh, Joseph of Arimathea was paying. Nicodemus comes out in the, you know, towards the evening, towards the dark, you know, always scared, things that were going on. He comes out. But here you have at least two of these women are sitting opposite the tomb, watching what they're doing, watching the sun going down, knowing the Sabbath is about to start. But the point is, is when they come back on Monday, they know exactly where to go. And that's important because what some of the higher critics of Scripture say, well, it wasn't that Jesus was resurrected from the dead. These dummy women went to the wrong tomb. This flies right into the face of this. They sat there and watched what was happening. So they knew where Jesus was. They knew his anointing for his death was not finished. And they knew exactly where to go on Monday morning. And they also knew that it was probably a waste of time other than to show their love. Because everything was over. All the dreams, all the plans, all the ambitions. All the good thoughts of what was coming of a kingdom where peace would reign is all gone they watched the crucifixion from a distance and followed Jesus even in death to see where he would be buried they knew that his burial anointing was incomplete so as soon as the Sabbath was completed they leave early on that morning with spices determined to complete the anointing they went to fulfill custom as much as a tribute of love we find that same attitude remember Mary the sister of Lazarus how Jesus is at that meal in the first part of the week of Passover, just in this past week. It seems so long ago, but it was just in the past week. And remember, she comes into the room with that expensive oil of spikenard and anoints him from the top of his head to the bottom of his feet, dries his, his, with her hair his, his feet, and pours her tears out upon him. And even Jesus said, Mary has done what she could do. Leave her alone. She has done what she could do. Did she know something? Did she know his anointing would be incomplete? This is a pre-anointing for his death. The Bible tells us that she was anointing him for his burial. There's something about the spiritual receptivity of women. I say that. I've said it all my life. This is why our churches are mostly full of women. They have a reception of spiritual things that men do not have. But it's also why sometimes they get in trouble. Because they can get too spiritual, they can get too carried away on some things. And sometimes they need that dummy husband that isn't hearing half of what you're hearing to just be the brakes a little bit. But it's a compliment to you. Ladies, it is a compliment to you. Your spirituality far exceeds the spirituality of men. Jesus said Mary had done all she could do and now these women were doing the same. These women weren't just friends, they were believers. Believers whose hopes have been crushed and now anointing his body was actually all that they could do. And Mary says that they, they came, I'm sorry, Mark says they came early. Very early on the morning on the first day of the week they came to the tomb when the sun had risen. Having witnessed Jesus' crucifixion and incomplete burial, it's doubtful that these women slept very well on this Sabbath. You know, I can imagine. I, I've tried to put myself in this place. The place of where everybody's at. The women, the apostles, all of them. Jesus is dead. And it happened so quickly. They were enjoying on Thursday night all the way up to midnight. They were enjoying the Passover feast with one another. Jesus had given us the now the Lord had, had morphed that into the Lord's Supper. We had the first Lord's Supper uh, now making all the Passovers from here on invalid. 
And uh, they were just enjoying each other's company, praising God, singing hymns. And just by Friday night, he's in a tomb. How do you deal with that? How do you get your head around that? It's almost no different than when you say goodbye to somebody in the morning and it's just a normal day and that person goes out and gets hit struck by a car and they're dead. No warning, no nothing. No, how, do you, how do you adapt to this? How do you fill that emptiness? How do you come to grips with it? And I'm not sure these women knew how. But they were going to go furnish their, finish their labor of love. I can imagine that nobody was sleeping come early Sunday morning. Haven't you been there? Things have just, something's happened. Something has jarred your world. And you go to bed. And you know what's worse than trying to sleep? Is telling yourself to try to sleep. Haven't you done that? Well, if I go to sleep now, I'll get six hours. If I get to sleep now, I'll still get four hours. Next thing you know, you've been up all night. Because you know what? Your body is deadly tired, dreadfully tired. But your mind just can't stop. And you're running on pure adrenaline. I get in, got to witness anybody, you know what I'm talking about. These women are running on pure adrenaline, probably waiting I used to be like that when my cousin would take me fishing. He's the only one ever took me fishing when I was growing up. He'd want to get off at dawn. Well, I don't, he didn't have to wake me at dawn. I'd been up at least an hour before just staring, just staring, just staring. You know, like little kids do sometimes when they think they're going to open their Christmas presents. Just waiting and waiting and waiting. And in this case, the, the, just the, the terror of it all, trying to come to grips with it. There's no way to come to grips with it. We reach into John for a moment. John says this. Now the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb early while it was still dark and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. She won't wait for sunrise. She precedes the other women, arrives at the tomb in the early morning darkness. In that dusky light, she can make out, though, that the tomb is open. The large stone has been rolled away from the entrance. And they did that for a number of reasons. Number one, it kept critters out. You have to remember these dead bodies are being placed on shelves in the tomb. They will deteriorate. Even the, the spices and stuff just help. You know, when you really think about it, it is an act of love because it isn't doing any good. Don't you know that they anointed Lazarus, right? His sisters would have anointed him for his burial. He was already buried when Jesus got there. Remember, he leaves on the fourth day. He comes on the fourth day. And remember what she says, Lord... Don't go there. As it says in the King James, he stinketh. He has already deteriorated. So why? If in four days after, after all the spices and everything, they still stink, this is an act of love. This isn't like a mummification where you're preserving the body or anything. This is a strictly an act of love to put these sweet-smelling aromas on somebody who is going to stink 24 hours later. She doesn't go into the tomb, but instead she turns and she runs away to where Peter and John are, and she makes this statement. Then she ran and came to Simon Peter and to the other disciple whom Jesus loved, which is John, and said to them, they have taken away the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid them. The reason I point that out is notice that her, her, her conclusion is theft or kidnapping, if you will. Nobody, nobody is talking resurrection. As much as Jesus talked about it, nobody is talking about resurrection. She doesn't say a thing about it. It doesn't even enter into her thinking. Go back to Mark. And they said among themselves, who will roll away the stone from the door of the tomb for us? It appears that Joseph's, that jo, jo, uh, jo, yeah, Joseph of Arimathea's tomb had been carved into a hillside because it says they could look up and see that it was mud. So obviously that to look up, it had to be on a hillside. We go into the next verse of Mark. But when they looked up, they saw the stone had been rolled away for it was very large. At this point, the women had probably come to the same conclusion as Mary Magdalene. Someone had taken the body. Their bringing of spices evidences, evidences again that they weren't planning on a resurrection. You know, if they'd have been, if all things were equal, when he dies on the cross and Joseph of Marimathea puts him in the tomb, 
You wouldn't even have gotten spices. You wouldn't, you wouldn't have spent money for them. You, you wouldn't have sent the ladies. Every, the disciples wouldn't have been sitting in sadness. Everybody would have been sitting in anticipation. They would have been awake, not because of the horrors of what they went through, because, but of the joy of they know what's coming. You remember, he said three days, three days, Sunday's three days. It's no, don't even bother to anoint him. It's not going to be worth your time. He's going to be alive before then. He won't need it. Oh, what could have been said in faith, couldn't it? Put the spices away. This is one man that will never need it. He said he'd rise on the third day. And God promised that his son would not see corruption. He couldn't see a fourth day because corruption would have started. So it's the three days. And all the things, again, all the faith that could have been expressed. They couldn't think outside the tomb. No one, as often as Jesus talked about it could believe it they couldn't think past the tomb we know that the disciples kept the sabbath they're all staying inside number one they're frightened number two it was the law could only walk so far do so much on a sabbath day it's probably easier just to stay inside but not so for the holy keepers of the law here we go again even to the end of this we're going to see this hypocrisy of the holy law keepers, the Sanhedrin, the scribes, the Pharisees, uh, the elders, all these men of God. Look at what Matthew says. When Joseph had taken the body, he wrapped it in clean linen cloth and laid it in his new tomb, which he had hewn out of the rock, and he rolled a large stone against the door of the tomb and departed. And Mary Magdalene was there and the other Mary sitting opposite the tomb. On the next day which followed the day of preparation. What's the next day following the day of preparation? The Sabbath, okay? What happens on the Sabbath? Everybody stays home, okay? Everybody stays home. On the next day which followed the day of preparation, the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered together to Pilate. This is a high holy day in the Jewish calendar. And the holy men of Israel have defiled themselves to go into Pilate's palace. They don't care. And you have to remember, they're, they're frustrated now anyway. Joseph, Joseph of Arimathea has really thrown a wrench. I don't think we've ever heard this enough. Joseph of Arimathea threw a big wrench in their plans. They were determined that Jesus was going to end up in Gehenna, in the valley of Gehenna, the, where all the trash from the city was burned. That, was where, that is where unclaimed bodies went. And Jesus was going to be an unclaimed body because nobody would have had courage. And I remember it says that Joseph increased his courage to go into Pilate. Nobody would have had the courage to go in and do it. They wanted him in the trash heap being ripped open by the dogs and the other ones that went around that trash heap and did those heinous things. That is what they wanted to persecute Jesus even after death. But Joseph Arimathea, a member of the Sanhedrin, along with Nicodemus, has done the brave thing and asked for his body. So now they got a problem. So the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered together to Pilate saying, Sir, we remember. Sir, that had to hurt him to say that. They didn't like him. He hated them. Sir, we remember while he was still alive how that deceiver said, After three days, I will rise. Again, we know the disciples kept the Sabbath, but these righteous Sanhedrin men on this high holy Sabbath go into Pilate's palace. They picked and chose their defilements. They want Jesus' tomb sealed so the disciples can't steal his body and claim a false resurrection. And if you think about it, that's, that's smart in one respect. If you seal the tomb up, and no matter what you do, no matter how many spices, no matter what, they know that by a fourth day, he's going to start stinking. And Christianity could have been stopped in its tracks. Could have been stopped. Only, the only thing that they had to do was produce the body. All you had to do was take that rotting corpse, bring it outside, sit it up. You see those pictures of some of the old West days when Outlaws would get killed and they'd put them in a wood coffin and they'd set them up against the building so the people going by could see and confirm that they were dead. All you had to do was take Jesus' decomposing body, 
put it in a box or something else, lean it against the wall and let the people see him, and Christianity would have died right there. And it was also kind of funny when they think they're going to steal him for the resurrection when the, and say he's resurrected when they're not believing in a resurrection. The last thing they're talking about is resurrection. They have no clue about a resurrection. But something happens early in the morning. We come back here. Therefore, oh, for continuing that, that other verse. Therefore, com command that the tomb be made secure until the third day, lest his disciples come by night and steal him away and say to the people, he has risen from the dead. So the last deception will be worse than the first. Pilate said to them, you have a guard. No, he gave them a guard. I'm giving to it. They're yours to, to assign. Go your way. Make it as secure as you know how. So they went and they made the tomb, tomb secure, sealing the stone and setting the guard. But then we come back to Matthew 28. Now, after the Sabbath, after the, as the first day of the week began to dawn, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary came to see the tomb. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat on it. His countenance was like lightning and his clothing as white as snow, and the guard shook for fear of him and became like dead men. Some Bibles say a great earthquake, some say a severe earthquake, whatever it was, and whatever, whatever manifestation this angel took on himself, it took hardened Roman soldiers and put them in a coma of what they saw. I think that's funny compared to where most people think angels are. You know, I don't see two fat little babies with a couple small wings, you know, and shooting a little bow and arrow uh, standing around the tomb. This is an angel of the Lord comes down and these hardened men go into a comatose state. They all fall in the ground. We must remember that the stone wasn't rolled away to let Jesus out. It was only rolled away to let the women in. By the time the women get to the tomb, the soldiers are gone. And entering the tomb, they saw a young man. Mark calls him a young man. The other one calls him an angel. We've got all these different perspectives. Clothed in a long white robe. Some say there was one angel. Some say there was two angels. I personally believe it was two angels because everything God does is a witness. And this was a witness of the resurrection is in the mouth of, of two or three witnesses. They were clothed in a long white robe, sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. All four gospel writers want us to know one fact. The tomb is indeed empty. We go back to Matthew 28 now. Now while they were going, behold, some of the guard came into the city and reported to the chief priests all the things that had happened. When they had assembled with the elders and consulted together, they gave a large sum of money to the soldiers, saying, Tell them his disciples came at night and stole him away while we slept. That's a death penalty for a Roman soldier. That's why they say, And if this comes to the governor's ears, we will appease him and make you secure. So they took the money and did as they were instructed. And this saying is commonly reported among the Jews until this day. Mark writes 25 years after this fact, and they were still saying his body was stolen from the, by the disciples. And in fact, many Jews today say the same thing. That has stayed throughout all of history. A great earthquake, an angel of the Lord, as bright as lightning. And you still see that these self-righteous losers will not be moved from their hypocrisy. One of the present signs of the end of our age is Paul told Timothy that the times that we live in will become ragingly insane. Boy, are we there. Common sense means nothing anymore. Everything is just insane. You hear what people do and you go, that's nuts. You hear what some of our politicians do. Your answer is, that's nuts. You're right. It's ragingly insane. But you must also think, the Lord showed me, I hadn't thought about this, that the Sanhedrin was in their last days. They didn't know it, but they were in their last days. They will cease to exist by 70 AD. They'll be wiped out. They'll never be heard from again. And actually, because of what Jesus has done, there is no priesthood. It's all been wiped out. That whole thing is a dead issue. And they are just as ragingly insane in their end days as we see in our days. 
people won't think sanely or apply common sense. For the Sanhedrin, they may not have understood it, but they were in the last days of their existence and their decisions are equally insane. But they are in the last days. My point being, listen to what the soldiers tell them. There has been an earthquake. The second one, remember when Jesus dies on the cross, there's another earthquake. The curtain of the temple has been torn in two. There's been these severe earthquakes. There has been, uh, with those earthquakes, tombs were opened up and there are people right now walking in Jerusalem witnessing to their families of what they have experienced. Now we have another earthquake. Now we have this being that was seen that made them fall to the ground as dead men. Do any one of these super spiritual losers say, maybe we ought to pray about it? I mean, think what they were told. All this has happened. They're, they're witnesses of it. I mean, just the earthquakes alone and the tombs opening up and watching the dead come, come to life and giving their witnesses, the, the curtain tearing, all these things that are happening up, and yet not one of them says, should we pray? Really speaks to us about our own attitudes and and the agent that we're living right now. Evil rulers are courting together right now. Evil rulers are consorting together. Individual freedoms are being taken away. The entire social structure is crumbling. Lawlessness is rampant across the country. But is anyone saying maybe we ought to pray about it? Except for a few faithful in the church. Nobody's, you know, let's, let's see what we can do about this. Let's call a meeting. Let's call a committee. Let's do this. Let's do that. But where? I mean, before D-Day, Franklin Roosevelt prayed an impressive prayer for our troops. You think that could happen today? Nobody says we should pray. None of those men, after what they'd been confronted with, not one of these holy men of God whose business it was to pray, said, let's pray about this. Men falling dead in a coma, falling into a death-like trance in a coma. An angel descending from heaven. Earthquakes happening, the dead rising, the curtain in the temple being torn in two. But nobody says, let's pray about it. So we go to Mark 16, 6. But the angel said to them, that, that young man, as Mark described him, do not be alarmed. Isn't that easy to say? They're coming into this tomb and they're seeing an angel. The other one says his his countenance is as bright as lightning. And he says, don't be alarmed. He says, you seek Jesus of Nazareth who was crucified. He is risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him. Like I said, don't be alarmed. Easy for him to say. In the Greek it says, don't be thrown into a terror. Do not be thrown. Do not be cast into a terror. But that's exactly where they were. The angel proceeds to give these women... The greatest three-word explanation in history, he is risen. Just those three words, and and that's the whole truth declared in three words. He is risen. It changes everything. Not he is missing, he is gone, he is moved, he is stolen, he's been kidnapped. He is risen. The fact of his resurrection leads to a very normal question from the angel to the ladies. Let me say that again. Because he said he is risen, he is not here, now we're told that an angel asks them a question. It's found in Luke. Then as they were afraid and bowed their faces to the earth, they, Luke says there's two angels, they said to them, why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here but he is risen. They're trying to get the eyes of these women off the fact that it's a tomb. Some years ago, the Lord gave me this for a funeral. Because always in a funeral, the the, the job of the angels as a pastor at a funeral, get people's eyes off of the dead and onto the living. And that statement, why do, you, why do you seek the living among the dead? 
I have put that in more funeral sermons because my job is like the angels. When, when you come to a funeral, when it's time for a funeral, your job as a pastor is to get people's eyes off of the current condition because everybody is glued on the, the, you know, the sadness of it all, the, 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 the missing relationship, all these things. And all those things are valid. It's true. But you've got to set the tone right away. And so I'll always say, if you have come to see so-and-so, or dear brother, dear sister, that has fallen asleep in the Lord. If you've come to see them here today, you're going to go away disappointed. They are not here. They have risen. And that's actually the truth. They're not there. If you came to see them, and there's people that think that when they come into a, a funerary parlor and, and they see that, that corpse laying there of their loved one or friend or whatever, you know, just to understand that they're not there. But there's people who do believe that. There's people who don't understand the fact that they've already risen. They're not here. This is why I love to do Christian funerals. I hate doing non-Christian funerals. And I've had to do them because out of love for somebody or respect for somebody or somebody basically begging you to do it. And you try to put the best spin on it. But it's hard to put a good spin on something when you know, you know, you know somebody wasn't a Christian. But I'll tell you what, once, that's why my first question, whenever I'm asked to do a funeral of anybody I don't know, the first question is, are they a Christian? Because it changes everything. And so when those people come in with their tears and their mourning and everything else, is the first thing you want to do is disappoint them. If you came to see brother so-and-so or sister so-and-so, you're going to go home disappointed. If you think that's it, if you think that's them, and if you think that's there, you are going to go home disappointed because they are risen. That's the good news of the Christian faith. They are risen. It changes everything. They haven't been able to keep their eyes off the angel. So what does the angel say? He says, wait a minute, wait. He says, he says, he says you know, don't, don't look at me. He says, look at where they laid him. He's trying, you know, they're, they're so enraptured with this angel. They're scared to death. They got their faces in the dirt. And the angel's understanding, they got to quit looking at me. Come here, look at where they laid him. Look at what's happening. Because really what it comes down to is, it's, the angels are saying, he's risen. It's get on with it. Haven't you, if, you know, you, go, you have a funeral in your own family, it may be one of your dearest loved ones, but you normally go back to your house or someplace and you have a wake, right? You have a meal or something. And doesn't it always hit you almost immediately how life just goes on? You can't dwell back there at the funeral parlor. You've been to the funeral parlor. You've been to the cemetery. We've said all the right words. We've prayed all the right prayers. Now it's time to realize that life goes on. I feel so sorry, and I'm not mocking this, I, I sincerely feel so sorry for people who have to put their, what do you call it, their testimonies, their, their witness on the side of the highway. All of you are familiar going up Highway 61 south of Hannibal. There's that cross that is dedicated to that little girl, I guess she was killed in a car accident there. I figured if she'd be middle-aged today, that thing has been there so long, she, she would, if she had lived, she'd been middle-aged today. And it's one thing to honor our dead, but in Christ, our dead are not dead. When do you let go of it? When do you get on with it? When do you get on with the program? Life goes on. For the Christian, death is just an inconvenience. It inconveniences our heart. It puts a hole in our heart, but it's not the end. Somebody said, and I use this in funerals all the time, whether a story has a happy ending or not depends on where you end the story. If you're not in Christ and this is a funeral and that casket right there, then this is the end of the story and we got a whole lot to be sad about. But if this person is in Christ, we are the happiest of all people because the story isn't over. And I know how the story ends. If you die in Christ, I'm, right, I'm going to preach all of your funerals right now. Every one of you. If you die in Christ, if you stay in the faith, if you don't fall away, which is proof that you have been truly born again because you can't fall away if you haven't, I'm going to tell you right now the last words of my funeral for you. And you lived happily ever after. That's how it ends. That's how, isn't that great? So why are you looking at me? Look where they laid him. Look at the blood. Look at the linen. There's the proof of this. This is the right tomb, ladies. You got it all right except for one thing. He's not here. He is risen. Oh, praise God. He is risen. So now, go. What's the next thing? He's like, go. Tell. It isn't a request. It's a command. Go tell. Go tell. Go tell the others that Jesus will meet with them in Galilee. 
We go to Mark 16, 7. It says, but go, tell his disciples and Peter that he is going before you into Galilee. There you will see him as he said to you. And he, he had said that earlier uh, in the week that he said, I will, I will see you again in Galilee. Now, Mark doesn't get into all this, but you know that Jesus has to appear to the disciples. He appears to the two men on the road, to Emmaus. You know, he appears in the upper room, says, touch me, feel me. You know why he had to do that? Because they weren't getting up and going. They were still so locked into his death that when they brought the command of God, go, he's going before you in Galilee. Jesus can't even get to Galilee because he's got to give more special attention to them because they're not getting up and moving because they just can't believe he is risen. Isn't that amazing? The testimony of these women. Ladies, you wonder why you're not believed. You come and tell these men, we've seen these angels we know what has happened here's what they said to do and they don't do it so Jesus has to personally come on the scene and uh, tell these guys but it's also interesting that the angel says tell my disciples and Peter Peter needs a little TLC right now he's had a tough crucifixion he was his own worst enemy he didn't understand the, how bad his flesh could be His flesh got him in trouble. I will never betray you. And of course we know he does. But I think that is so fantastic. What a God we serve in the midst of this greatest events of history. He says, and Peter. If we could take a snapshot of this moment in time. Right here at the door of the tomb, we'll find three streams of witness that converge together. We have the witness of the empty tomb. We have the witness of the two angels. And we have the witness of the women. The words of the angels to the ladies was a command. Go and tell. And again, it was wonderful to see that this included Peter. Who needed that extra bit of love right now. And all you can say is what grace, what kindness. And so they leave the tomb. So they went out quickly. Notice the word quickly. Mark uses it over and over and over again. So they went out quickly and fled from the tomb. Notice he, he, the, 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 the others just say they left the tomb. This, he says they got up quickly and they fled, they ran. For they trembled and were amazed. And they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. That is the last verse of the Gospel of Mark. So now you should say to me, why? I've got 11 more verses in my Bible. If you look closely, if you, depending on what Bible you have, you will find that those last 11 verses are in brackets. Beyond that, if you look at the last couple verses, they are normally in a different print. Because they were, the, the, the 11 verses are an add-on, and the last very verse is an add-on to an add-on. Here's what happened. In time, church fathers were looking at this, and they said, no. Haven't you ever seen in movies where they film an alternative ending? Kind of choose the ending that you want, you know? Well, they were going to choose Mark's ending because they're saying that this ending is too abrupt. It's too abrupt. Mark, Mark just says... The women leave. They're scared. They run. They go quickly. And they go to obey him and tell the disciples what has happened. And so the church fathers, the early church fathers, now we say, well, wait a minute, does that mean they added to Scripture? They did, but what they added was scriptural. They tell me that those who study the manuscripts, the ancient manuscripts in the original languages, they say you can find in the last 11 verses of Mark every place that it came from from the other three Gospels. They picked this, put it behind Mark, picked this, put it in Mark, picked this, put it in Mark, which pretty much agrees then with what Matthew said, the Great Commission and everything else. But this was done because they just thought Mark ended too abruptly. We can't just stop the story like that. And you know what I say? I say to do it any other way would have been a disservice to Mark. This is the way Mark's whole gospel has been abrupt. He wanted to show one thing and one thing only. His sign, if you will, is the ox. And the ox is the servant. 
and all Mark intended to do. He wasn't given the history lessons like the other guys do. That's why so much is missing. All he wanted to show was Jesus as the suffering servant. And it was always about get on with it, get on with it. And immediately he went here and immediately he went there and immediately the man was healed and suddenly this and suddenly that. Mark is filled with that and that's exactly how it ends. And how could it end any better? The women are scared. They're amazed. They've seen the angels. They've got the word of the commission. They've got the word to tell the disciples. And they run from the temple. And Mark just says, yes, it's done. Why add those 11 verses just to make it prettier, to make it flesh out a little bit? I think it does a disservice to Mark. This is how his whole gospel has been. This is how it ends. This is Mark. You know what the word is to us? Get up, get going, get preaching. We got things to tell people. Amen. Amen. Oh, Father God, I thank you. Lord, I got so much out of this journey going into Mark. I never had taught it before like this. I pray that all of us have learned some things, Lord, and at least opened our eyes to some understanding. And Lord, I thank you for, for Mark and his obedience, Lord God, his listening to your spirit. Actually, when, why, why change what the Holy Spirit has inspired? This is what you had for him to say. And it's what you say to us, Lord. It's what you say to us is just go and tell this beautiful, beautiful message to people. The thing that differentiates us from any other religion in the world is this is our story as well. Die with Christ, raise with Christ, live with Christ forever and ever. Amen. 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 I just wanted to, I didn't, what did I do? You got to love them. You got, you got to love them. You don't know the scheming that goes on up there. I didn't develop it enough. I just want to say one more thing to you. Just make sure that you realize when times come, it will for all of us, that we live beyond the tomb. We live beyond the funeral, funeral service. You know, that we realize... We will mourn, but we don't mourn like the world, not like those who have no hope. We've got a job to do. And so our loved ones have gone on before us. Praise God. I, I, we're jealous. We'd like to be in their rest. But we got work to do. You woke up this morning, you got a job to do. I've got a job to do. We've got a message to tell. And I'll tell you what, again, I want to thank you all so much. Because you make, I, I, I don't want you ever to think, why just skip running in the ground about the prisons? That's how I sometimes think you might think about this. You're the ones that are making it possible for this to happen. And we've had 40 guys sign up for this discipleship course. They'd only let us have 11, but we're training these 11. And, and in my mind, I see this picture of a bow being brought back with an arrow being brought back that's on fire. And we're going to release these guys into the world with a good knowledge of what the gospel says. And in the meantime, they're sharing this in the prison. And they're not going to, they're no, not one of them is going to say, do you really think Jesus was raised from the dead? They're going to know Jesus was raised from the dead. And they're going to preach the gospel that we're going to contend for. Amen. So thank you. You make it possible. You can go home now. Go. Tell. Do tell. And to the people in the crow's nest. I'm sorry. Eagle's nest. <laughs>